Each day, when the weather is good and I'm not too worn out, I put on the distinctive attire of a competitive cyclist and throw my leg over the top tube of my specialized tarmac to navigate the county roads and highways of central Georgia for enjoyment and exercise. Over the last few years, one of the pieces of equipment that I've taken along with me is a Garmin 500 GPS unit that is able to record the data of my ride for documentation and analysis purposes. One of the things my Garmin is able to do, after a bit of calibration time, is locate my position on the Earth to within an accuracy of less than 5 meters at every second of my ride. At any time during my ride or afterwards, I can know a nearly exact measurement of my bicycle's latitude and longitude on the Earth and from that data and some interpolation software, the Garmin can calculate my speed and heading. This, of course, is technology that uses communication with a series of geosynchronous satellites positioned around the Earth at an altitude of roughly 37,500 kilometers above its surface. It should go without saying that these satellites are in positions based on calculations first introduced by Isaac Newton. Sometimes when I ride, to help the miles pass a bit more quickly, I imagine what it must have been like to try and find one's position some 400 years ago. An error of just one degree of measurement in either latitude or longitude would have resulted in being off by some 65 miles, about the distance between Atlanta and Gainesville, Georgia, or Medford, Oregon and Wairika, California. A two degree error would result in a ship being off by a distance larger than the length of Georgia's coastline. It's a far cry from the accuracy I enjoy while riding my bike. And yet, for sailors of the late 17th century, this one degree level of accuracy was unobtainable, with errors in reading longitude being significantly larger than that. On a wide and vast ocean, such errors could compound quickly and make finding one's way across the seas a treacherous endeavor. This peril was not lost on any of the men who sailed the open waters in the Age of Discovery or during the beginning of the Enlightenment afterwards. Among those who felt the need for a better way to determine the position of a ship was a scientist who had grown up around the docks of London. In listening to the stories of sailors who had traveled across the Atlantic Ocean, he knew the anxiety the uncertainty of position created. He had heard of and perhaps known men whose lives had been ended when their ships ran aground and foundered because they had not known how close to a reef or shoreline they were. In 1692, however, Edmund Halley thought he had a plan to help with the problem. All he needed was a ship, a crew, some instrumentation, and the funding to pay for it all. Fortunately, he knew some important people in very high places. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 27.7, Supplemental. Edmund Halley, Gentleman Adventurer. In 1691, Halley was in an interesting position. On the one hand, he was one of England's most celebrated natural philosophers. In that year, he was involved on research to design a diving bell and associated diving suit that would allow for shipwreck salvage operations. And he was publishing his paper on the subject of using a future transit of Venus to determine the size of the solar system with fairly high accuracy. On the other, his character and devotion to his faith had been attacked as part of a process to determine if he was the right man for the open position as the civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford, a position for which he was not selected. 
How Halley dealt with these two competing narratives about his own life is rather illustrative. Instead of focusing on the forces arrayed against him and the setback he had been dealt, Halley moved on to other projects and ideas. He worked on those things he had control over and, instead of dwelling on the negative, he sought out other places and ways in which he could make important and unique contributions. In this, it was clear that there was no person in England, and perhaps all of Europe, who knew more about both astronomy and terrestrial magnetism, and how they could be applied to work on things like navigation across the open seas. With this in mind, Halley soon proposed an idea so audacious that it most directly compares to some of the great scientific missions of the space probes over the last 20 or 30 years here in our time today. As I've said, navigation at sea was a dicey proposition. While latitude could be found from the measurement of the North Star and, with a bit more difficulty, the altitude of the sun at noon, both of these required clear skies and a relatively stable deck from which to observe. Longitude, as we've mentioned in other episodes, was much, much more difficult to get at. In theory, the best approach to determining longitude was to know the time at a given known longitude, say the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, determine the local time, and then use the difference to determine how many degrees east or west of the known longitude you were. For example, a ship might measure the moment when the sun was due south and thus know that it was local noon. If a clock set to Greenwich time and carried along with the voyage showed that it was 1 p.m. there, then a ship's navigator would know that the vessel would be 15 degrees west of Greenwich on account of the Earth's rotation being 1 degree every 4 minutes. Easy peasy, assuming, of course, your clock set in Greenwich keeps accurate time, which, for a whole variety of reasons, it really doesn't. It would still be almost 50 years before timepieces would be developed that could be relied on to do that. Instead, due to navigational issues, several hundred ships a year went to the bottom of the ocean after unexpectedly encountering reefs, rocks, and shorelines because navigators didn't know exactly how far east or west they were with enough accuracy. While some techniques have been developed to determine the speed of a ship's travel, methods that give us nautical terms like logbook and knots, or nautical miles, these methods were estimations at best and at times little more than guesswork. Some navigators, however, had begun using compasses to not just tell the direction they were traveling, but also in estimating longitude. This method was based on an understanding that since the magnetic variation changed in a regular manner on well-known shipping routes, measuring that change gave a way of estimating a ship's longitude. While not a uniform practice, there were those navigators who swore by it, especially those who had, through the experience of sailing the same route over and over, gained an intuition of how the variation changed as they crossed the open water. What Halley realized was that if magnetic variation could be more accurately determined over a large expanse of ocean, and then also the coastlines, and then charted, all navigators would be able to use that data to better determine their position on the high seas. So, in 1693, he proposed a mission of scientific exploration to create just such a map to Queen Mary, who, being a strong supporter of both the sciences and the maritime industry of England, approved what was the first endeavor of its kind. She commissioned that a ship be built and outfitted to be commanded by a civilian officer commissioned in the Royal Navy for the sole purpose of undertaking a rigorous examination of the magnetic variation across the Atlantic and establishing with the greatest possible accuracy the latitudes and longitudes of as many ports of call as could be obtained. The civilian commander of the newly christened Paramore was to be none other than Edmund Halley himself. It was the first mission of its kind ever to be conceived, and it ran counter to almost every piece of maritime tradition found in the Royal Navy. However, ships take time to build, and political fortunes change. In December of 1694, Mary, always frail as a result of a series of miscarriages, succumbed to a smallpox epidemic that swept through Britain, leaving the kingdoms in the hands of of her less than fully engaged husband, William III, who preferred Holland and the European continent to damp and dreary England. 
Though the Paramore's construction had been finished, she remained in wet docks, still needing to be outfitted, while William pursued war against France. Halley, needing work to do, was contacted by Newton in 1696 as the older man undertook his project to save England's currency and finances. Newton needed smart, diligent, and trustworthy men to run the series of temporary mints he was going to establish as part of his recoinage project. Would Halley, presently unoccupied, consider taking up the post at Chester? Halley agreed, hoping that Newton would return the favor by using his new connections at court to get the mapping project moving again. What was supposed to be a one-year project stretched into two, but that extra time allowed the wheels of state to turn to a more agreeable configuration. It should be noted that while overseeing the Minchester, Halley, ever the active participant, made time to make all of the usual observations, establishing with great accuracy the town's latitude and longitude, the values of magnetic dip and variation, and he even climbed the local hills to measure the change in barometric pressure as a function of altitude, just as he had done on St. Helena. He also began to collaborate with Newton on another project, the one for which he is best known today. The two men began looking at accounts of comet sightings and measurements to see which, if any, might be repeat appearances of the same object on a shorter period elliptical orbit. While it would take a bit of time for the project to bear fruit, it once again shows Halley's ever-inquisitive nature. In 1697, William concluded the war with France and signed the Treaty of Ryswick. With this issue settled, he could now turn to more domestic matters, including those projects that had been close to his now deceased wife's heart. One such project was the establishment of a second grade institution of higher education in the American colonies. Another was to revisit what was now being called the Paramore Expedition. In 1698, with the seas reasonably safe for travel by English vessels of a non-military bearing, William once again greenlighted the project. The ship, again named the Paramore, was a 52-foot-long vessel known as a Pink, a type of ocean-going frigate that had a broader beam and shallower draft, allowing it to hold a bit more cargo than a conventional military vessel, but that also impeded its ability to navigate and negotiate environments with strong winds. It was a tough ship to handle, and the crew of 18 would have their hands full until they learned the idiosyncrasies of their hybrid vessel. The voyage was slated to last a year, and the mission was to map the magnetic phenomena of the Earth across the Atlantic Ocean, both north and south of the equator. Added to this was the instruction to more surely establish the terrestrial coordinates of those British colonial possessions where the ship might stop. This expedition, however, was filled with difficulties and setbacks, including problems with the vessel itself and a crew that didn't exactly take to its new civilian commander. Halley had had the good foresight to insist in his original request that his crew be taken from the ranks of the Royal Navy rather than from the usual rabble rounded up from the docks of London. This gave the Paramore's crew a level of professionalism unusual for the time. The downside of this, however, was that the seasoned hands that now pulled the lines of the pink did so at the commands of a gentleman captain who had not seen combat or sailed the high seas, his one trip to St. Helena notwithstanding. This created an atmosphere of tension that would eventually ripen into mistrust and then mutiny. The main source of the problem was the man selected by the Admiralty to be Halley's second-in-command. He had once attempted to put forward a method for determining longitude that had been rejected by the Navy, the Royal Society, and the Royal Observatory as being both impractical and unworkable. Prominent in the criticism of the method, Halley had written a strong opinion against it. Whether this played into the power struggle between the two men that developed is unclear, but partway through the voyage, the officer began to question Halley's orders, and then he directly disobeyed one of Halley's specific navigational instructions. The two men confronted each other, and when the first officer claimed that Halley, quote, couldn't be trusted to command a longboat, end quote, things had come to a head. Halley had the man arrested and confined to his cabin, an act that showed that while there was a threat to his leadership role, Halley still had the trust of enough of his crew that he could exert his will on the high sea. That he then took over the sole navigation of the ship and guided it home with nary an incident likely helped his reputation quite a bit. So did the fact that he had not lost a single crew member. <laughs> 
something rather remarkable for this time. Upon returning to England, he had the first officer and two other members of the crew court-martialed. While the trial was a bit of a farce, with the members of the Admiralty not being willing to punish a seasoned officer on the charges brought by a man not considered to be one of their own, Halley's resoluteness regarding his place sent a signal that would serve him in good stead over the next few years. While he had managed to collect a good bit of data during the truncated voyage, it was clear that the mission had not achieved its full goals. Halley thus proposed a second voyage that would, after the Paramore received some refitting, continue and extend the mission. Approved by William, the ship, again with Halley at its helm, set sail on September 27th of 1699, with the same goals except for one added. For many years, there had been rumors of another undiscovered continent, Terra Incognito. While this was likely the Australian landmass, many expected to find it south of the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa, in other words, what we now know to be Antarctica. As with all such rumors, the expectation was that the place was full of gold and other such wonders, and so William charged Halley to try and see if he could find it and claim it for the British crown. Notably, on this voyage, Halley did not take a second in command and made sure that he had a more agreeable set of warrant officers to enact his will. As a result, the voyage went much more smoothly, though early on Halley did lose a member of the crew in a storm. He was a very young man and Halley took the death very, very hard, with friends reporting that after he returned, Halley would invariably tear up at the mention of the loss. The first stop for this trip was Rio de Janeiro in December. The expedition then pushed south, reaching 51.5 degrees south latitude, roughly equivalent to the Straits of Magellan, though they were much, much further east than that. On that day, the crew reported sighting a number of islands off in the distance that they thought might signal the edge of the southern continent. However, sailing further south, as they approached, they began to question this initial assessment. From a distance, the islands had looked to have tall, chalky cliffs similar to those seen in England. As they approached, though, they realized that they were not white with chalk, but rather ice. In this, they realized that they were now in great danger as they were sailing among icebergs that were hundreds of feet tall and many, many miles long. What isn't clear, at least from the sources I've consulted, is whether or not Halley and his crew truly recognized their danger at first. While it seems unlikely that none of them had ever heard of icebergs, the logbooks indicate that they had a hard time wrapping their minds around the idea that they could be as big as what they were seeing. As such, their first assumption was that they were actually seeing ice piled up on top of islands, but try as they might, they couldn't seem to find a rising ocean bottom, even when they played out their depth lines to a depth of 140 fathoms or about 850 feet. Forced to accept the reality of what they were amongst, things got worse the next day as a very dense fog rolled into the region, reducing visibility to less than a couple of hundred feet. This required that they move slowly and carefully, something that wasn't the pink's strong suit. I'd like to take a moment here to paint a picture for those who might not have been in this sort of environment before. Imagine these 20 or so men floating in a vessel that was roughly 50 feet by 20 feet, or about the width and half the length of a single wide mobile home, or for those who like to travel by RV, the size of a large pull-behind fifth wheel RV. A good way to think of this vessel would be to think of a single wide mobile home cut in half and the two pieces stacked on top of the other. They're gliding under light winds through an iceberg field where the walls of ice are towering over the highest masts of their ship by a hundred feet or more. The icebergs are cracking and groaning all around them and giving off an otherworldly bluish light. I don't know if they would have seen one of those monstrosities calf or slough off a huge sheet of ice into the water, but if they had witnessed this, they had to be wondering what would happen to their ship if they happened to be too close to an iceberg when that happened. The temperature in the iceberg field hovered just above freezing, and so the entire ship was cold. Then the fog rolled in, and ice began to accumulate on every exposed surface, most notably the sails and lines that controlled them. The fog was thick enough that visibility was reduced to about a quarter of a mile, and the icebergs became dark, hulking, menacing shadows that loomed out of the fog as the ship threaded its way through the maze, 
guided only by its compass needle and the sharp eyes of the lookouts in the icy rigging. If the ship turned the wrong direction or was pushed by a hard wind in the wrong way, it would crash into the submerged portions of the bergs and have its hull staved in, marooning the crew far south of any shipping lane or port of call. Halley wrote in his journal, We are in imminent danger of losing our ship among the ice, for the fog was all the morning so thick that we could not see for long about us. End quote. Yet so skilled was Halley, and so experienced his crew at this time, that they managed to extract themselves from the difficult circumstances and sail north to warmer waters. This was the first time the Paramore had had to change its course, but in its attempt it had managed to sail further south than any vessel to date. When it turned around, it was 13 degrees north of the Arctic Circle, and just north of the South Georgia Islands, just off the continent that would remain hidden for another 70 years before it was discovered by James Cook. At the end of this second expedition, one filled with a number of additional adventures, Halley returned to England after a year at sea. He would be hailed as something of a hero, and, taking his data from the two voyages, would soon publish a map showing magnetic variation in a unique way now commonly copied. On a typical Mercator projection map of the Earth's surface, he superimposed lines of equal magnetic variation over the typical latitude and longitude lines. By doing this, he provided a way to find longitude from the other two measurements. All a navigator had to do was measure his latitude and then observe his compass's variation from north. This would allow him to find his position on Halley's map, which would then tell him the longitude of the vessel within about a degree or two. This map would build off the data visualization work Halley had done with his St. Helena data in 1691, and has now become a standard way of displaying when some physical quantity is the same on a two-dimensional map. Examples of these isogenic lines, as they were called, would be lines of equal elevation on a topographic map and isobaric lines on a weather map, or lines of constant pressure. His lines of equal magnetic variation would become known as Halian lines and would be included in books on maritime navigation well into the 20th century. Moreover, the two voyages of the Paramore would show that scientific missions conducted by military organizations could bring about huge gains in knowledge. Without Halley and the Paramore, there would have been no James Cook and the Endeavor, Charles Darwin and the Beagle, and James T. Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. One of the things you'll hear mariners say is that once a person has gotten a taste of the sea, it's difficult for them to return to the land for very long, and this seems to have been the case for Halley. With an experienced crew and a solid vessel, Halley decided to undertake one more mission of exploration and discovery, though this time it would be much closer to home and of much greater national security interest. The English Channel had long acted as Britain's great moat discouraging the governments of the European continent from invading the island nations there. The security of this moat was enhanced by England's strong navy, but in recent years it had been made clear that other notions, most notably the hated French, were also developing their maritime power in such a way so as to challenge British dominance on those seas. William understood that for England to remain a player on a world scale, it would need to leverage this nautical advantage, and so he was keen on not only building a strong navy, but also for giving it every advantage in warfare. In the recent wars with France, it had become understood that the English Channel was one of the most difficult bodies of water to navigate. Along with the uncertainty of wind and weather, there were changes in tides and currents that were little understood. Halley's work in diving and salvage had showed him that this lack of information posed a threat to anyone attempting to navigate the treacherous waters along the coastlines of Britain. Halley's interest in this topic likely went back to research he did to determine the exact place Julius Caesar had landed his forces along the English coastline. This research, by the way, still forms the basis for all subsequent discussions on that topic. <laughs> 
Another factor that provided insight was Halley's work on the Principia, wherein Newton had explained the causes of the tides and provided the first models to understand them. As a result of this, Halley proposed one final mission for the Paramore, and that would be to survey the tides and currents of the English Channel for the Royal Navy. William, of course, quickly approved the project. Throughout the summer of 1701, Halley and his crew anchored in the bays and estuaries along the coasts of England, France, and Holland, making observations and taking measurements in order to provide the British Royal Navy an advantage over its rivals in understanding just how the water ebbed and flowed based on the rotation of the earth, the phases of the moon, and the effects of local geography. So ahead of his time was Halley that no similar tidal survey would be carried out by any nation or organization for more than 150 years after this. So important was the data that it would remain something of a state secret made available only to the commanders of the ships of the Royal Navy as war once again broke out with France over the matter of Spanish secession. In 1702, shortly after Halley finally traded in his sea legs for the last time, William III died, and the throne passed to the last of the Stuart line, Queen Anne. Halley, now quite the celebrity in England, received a 200-pound bonus for his servants of the crown after writing a poem for Her Majesty's coronation. This began a period when Halley's association with the government became something a bit more formal and also a bit more secretive. While the Channel Survey had mostly been a scientific mission, the idea has been put forward that it carried with it a secondary mission of espionage, especially as the Paramore and her crew spent time on the eastern side of the Channel mapping the coastlines of France and the Netherlands. When the War of Spanish Secession broke out, known in Britain as Queen Anne's War, it started in 1703, and Halley was sent on a series of diplomatic missions and by diplomatic missions, I of course mean spying missions, to England's allies in Europe, thus bolstering that claim that Halley was an early member of Her Majesty's Secret Service. After consulting in Austria on coastal fortifications on the Adriatic and establishing stronger ties in Hanover, Halley returned to England and put all of his knowledge to good use in designing defenses for the coastal areas closest to France in case Louis XIV decided to expand his military operations to harassing English coastal cities or even planning an invasion. Towards the end of that year, John Wallace, Newton's longtime correspondent and civilian chair of geometry at Oxford, died leaving his position vacant. While Halley had been too controversial to obtain a professorship back in 1691, he was now more or less a shoo-in for the position. Even though Flamsteed still worked behind the scenes to prevent the appointment, Queen Anne's patronage of Halley and his own growing list of publications and accomplishments overwhelmed any negative input from the increasingly bitter astronomer Royale. Here's the thing, though. Halley wasn't really a true mathematician in any way. He had been an astronomer and natural philosopher his whole life, and he had learned what mathematics he needed to know in service of those disciplines. Now, to be sure, the mathematics Halley had engaged in was first rate, but he didn't have a comprehensive understanding of the full range of the subject of geometry. So the first thing he did was set out to rectify that shortcoming. As one might expect, he went back to the earliest sources and soon found a glaring hole in the historical record. The works of the Greek mathematician Apollonius were sorely underrepresented. You may recall us discussing Apollonius in our early episodes in this series as the mathematician who originated the idea of using epicycles on deference to trace out non-circular paths through space, specifically with reference to the moon. His work, of course, was picked up first by Hipparchus and later Ptolemy. By the time of Halley, much of Apollonius' work was either unknown or found only in poor Latin translations that often dated back to the Middle Ages. As such, the new professor took it upon himself to rectify this gap in the mathematical knowledge available to his colleagues and students. The only problem, as Halley was soon to learn, was that much of the needed information could only be found in sources written in Arabic, and much of that was pretty inferential. So what did he do? He learned Arabic, of course, and then he found every single source he could that mentioned or seemed to use the work of Apollonius, and then constructed out of all of that data a completely new translation of the Greek mathematician's work. 
To be clear, much of this work built on earlier efforts of other British mathematicians. But Halley's contributions provided many key missing pieces and brought to fruition the first complete Latin translation of Apollonius. And here again, I want to pause for just a moment to take in what Halley has done. His appointment to the Oxford position was really more of a reward and a recognition of his previous work. All he was expected to do was, to do was to present a few lectures and teach a few students and carry on with whatever he felt like carrying on with, which everyone probably thought would be to continue acting as a diplomatic agent and part-time spy for the British Crown and Royal Society. Instead, he decided to enter into the field of historical research in mathematics and thereby produce what was for some time the best work on arguably one of the most important figures in Hellenistic Greek mathematics. It's really just stunning, to be honest. And the work didn't stop there. Remember that I mentioned that prior to the Paramore expeditions, he and Newton had begun a project of analyzing cometary orbits? In 1705, he published a paper that shared with his fellows at the Royal Society the fruits of that labor. So let's dig into that just a bit more. The original work he and Newton had done was to look at the orbit of the 1680 comet in some detail. Newton suspected that the orbit was elliptical with an aphelion, or furthest distance from the Sun, of about 10 to 12 times the distance of Saturn. If that were the case, the comet's orbit should return it to the inner solar system every few hundred years or so. What he asked Halley to do was search the historical record to see if there were sightings of earlier comets that might match that assumption. What Halley found was that there did seem to be a pattern of about 575 years where a possible comet returned to the same part of the sky. We now know that this isn't in fact the case, as the orbit of the 1680 comet has been since worked out in some detail from both Flamsteed's and Kirk's observations, and its orbital period is a lot closer to around 20,000 years. What's important for our story, though, is that the project got Halley looking to see if there were other possible shorter period comets. As he searched the records, most of the recording sightings seemed to have no correlation with each other appearing in different parts of the sky and following very different paths. There were, however, a series of comet appearances that did seem to line up with each other, the most recent being the Comet of 1682. What Halley found was that if he went back through the data, there was a comet that appeared to travel along the same path and that was seen from the Earth every 75 or 76 years. Working from the data collected during the sightings for those last three or four appearances, he was able to show that the observations could be accounted for by there being a single comet that traveled on a fairly elliptical path that took it some distance out past the orbit of Saturn before returning it to the inner solar system. If this were true, Halley worked out that the comet would be visible once again in the year of 1758 at around Christmas time. As we know, his prediction was verified, though he would be dead by that time, and it served as a significant verification of Newton's formulation of mechanics. Over time, Halley would return to this project and look further back into the historical record to see if he could find evidence of earlier sightings, doing so all the way back into the 14th century. Over time, astronomers have continued to extend this work backwards, finding accounts for passages back to before the birth of Christ, with the comet that appeared in the sky shortly after the murder of Julius Caesar and prior to the multiple invasions of England in 1066 being what we now know as Halley's Comet. Its most recent appearance was the disappointing 1986 pass through the inner solar system, which had the Earth in an unfavorable position to see the comet. Nevertheless, several space probes, most notably the Italian Giotto mission, took the first good data regarding the nucleus of the comet as well as some direct sampling of the materials found in the cometary tail. It was during this time that Halley was elected to the board of the Royal Society and was made an honorary secretary while Newton was elected president of the body. As Newton labored to put together the much improved second edition of the Principia, he and Halley used their political influence to pry data out of the hands of Flamsteed, who persisted in keeping it to himself. <laughs> 
As we've already spent a good bit of time talking about that conflict in our episodes on Newton, I won't belabor the issue here, other than to say that I can imagine that for Halley, Flamsteed's intransigence had to be both baffling and infuriating. As I've mentioned, Halley had what we might think of as a fully scientific mindset. Part of that way of thinking was that data and information was to be shared fully and openly so that other investigators could check and build on each other's work. Flamsteed, however, still lived in a paradigm where something like lunar observations and star charts would comprise the culmination of a man's lifetime of investigation and thus had to be perfected to the greatest possible degree. For Flamsteed, to publish a star chart before he had taken every single observation he could would have been a betrayal of the truth. For Halley, slightly imperfect data was better than no data all, at all, especially in the case where men's lives were involved, as was the case with celestial navigation on the high seas. This all came to a head in 1707 with what is known as the Scilly Islands Naval Disaster. While the details of this tragedy are beyond the scope of this episode, the loss of four ships of the line and between 1,500 and 2,000 sailors at the height of Queen Anne's War made the need for a more reliable way to determine longitude clear to all. While Halley's magnetic variation method was good for getting a ship's position within 100 miles, when in proximity of a coastline, that wasn't nearly good enough. Moreover, at the time, Halley's charts weren't always used, especially among the sailors of an older generation, and also compasses were often found in a state of disrepair, as seems to have been the case for the fleet that was involved in the disaster. In time, this whole thing led to the Longitude of Act of 1714 that established what was known as the Board of Longitude, convened to find better ways to determine longitude while at sea. Along with creating the board, the act made provisions for a large cash sum, some 20,000 pounds sterling, to be offered to anyone who could demonstrate a way to reliably establish a ship's longitude to within half a degree, a positional precision of about 30 nautical miles. Halley would be appointed to the board along with a number of other notable individuals. Just 12 days after the passing of the act, however, Queen Anne would die, passing the throne to the Hanoverian dynasty of King George I. Over the years, there were many different ideas regarding the best way to establish longitude, and while Halley personally favored a method using the motions of the moon, he was open-minded enough to allow for the possibility of any number of other options. The eventual solution would be developed by a wood joiner and clockmaker by the name of John Harrison, who would develop a chronometer that kept very accurate time in spite of the challenges presented by an ocean-going voyage. Halley was an early supporter of Harrison's work and would be instrumental in getting Harrison's first chronometer tested on a voyage to Lisbon, Portugal, thus securing funding for further development. In 1618, Halley undertook another astronomically related project that turned out to be of great significance. Though it is rarely recognized today, Halley's work here is of really important significance to our broader narrative. Halley's original project was to measure the precession of the equinoxes, the movement of the points where the sun's path along the ecliptic crosses the celestial equator, as we've discussed in previous episodes. The motion had been known about since before the time of Hipparchus, but the various measurements of the rate and, for even a time, the direction had given different results. While the reason for the motion had been explained in Newton's Principia, Halley decided that it would be a good idea to establish a more reliable estimate of the rate by taking the position of a number of stars on the celestial sphere, something you would have had from Flamsteed's data, and comparing that to the measurements made by both Ptolemy and Tycho. What he found was that in almost every instance, the stars on the celestial sphere had moved the same fixed amount over the intervening millennia, thus maintaining the same spacing between each other. This allowed him to establish the rate of precession. Note, however, that I said almost every star and not every star. What Halley discovered is that three stars, Aldebaran, Arcturus, and Sirius had in fact moved with respect to the other stars. Their coordinates on the celestial sphere had in fact shifted. 
In the case of Arcturus, this amount was roughly 30 arc minutes of angle, or about the width of the full moon, over the course of about 1500 years. This is thought to be the first actual observation of what is known as proper motion of the stars, and I think it's a really big deal. While men such as Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo had proposed models of the solar system with a stationary sun and a moving Earth, all of them assumed that the stars were fixed to a non-moving celestial sphere. A big sort of giant sphere a long ways away that the stars were sort of thumbtacked to, as it were. From what I've been able to find, this was also the position held by Newton. While others, most notably Giordano Bruno, had speculated a vast open space populated by stars at many distances, none of them seemed to have thought that the stars themselves actually moved. Halley's observations of these three bright stars had shown that it was possible for stars not to be fixed in place. While not the completely seismic shift of repositioning the Earth and Sun, this discovery was another important step in establishing a model of the heavens that was vastly different than that that had been held by almost all astronomers and natural philosophers up to that point. When examined in this way, from the perspective of the time when the paper reporting the results was published, we can recognize it as a truly important advancement towards the sort of cosmological picture we take for granted today where the sun is just one of an innumerably large number of stars scattered throughout space, all moving with respect to each other. While Halley's observations did not rule out a real celestial sphere, I'll bet one wherein the stars were no longer permanently attached, they did significantly weaken the argument for that kind of a model. It's truly a stupendous piece of work and monumental in the history of astronomy, and unfortunately, it's often completely overlooked. In 1620, Flamsteed died, and at the age of 64, Halley was named as the second Astronomer Royal. It was a position for which he had been preparing himself for most of his life, and after some initial difficulties of re-equipping the facilities after Flamsteed's widow took all of the instruments that Flamsteed had bought over the years, Halley settled into a robust observing program that regularly reported its results to all interested parties. Halley's number one priority was the problem he had worked on, on, on and off with Newton for years, precisely determining the orbital motions of the moon. While all professional astronomers knew that the moon's motion varied on a regular 18 and a half year cycle, no one had made precise enough measurements of that motion to pin down what the various influences of the Earth's, Sun's, and other gravitational forces were. It was a long project, and most were loath to undertake it. Halley, however, ever the true scientist, jumped in with both feet, even though he was now in his mid-sixties. Many assumed that he would not live long enough to complete the work. He would, however, prove them wrong, publishing a complete set of data at the age of 82. During the work, Halley would develop a method of finding longitude in the 1730s that would allow a navigator to make observations of the moon and determine their position within 70 or so miles. While more accurate than any other method, it was still short of the hoped for accuracy. The much di greater difficulty with the method, however, was that as the measurements began to reveal greater complexity in the lunar orbit, the necessary calculations to use the data became correspondingly more complex and time-consuming, thus rendering the method inaccessible to all but the most mathematically inclined navigators. As Harrison's chronometers became more accurate and compact, that solution would overtake any fully celestial approach. In 1736, Halley's wife of 55 years would pass away. Soon after, Halley would suffer a stroke that left him somewhat paralyzed on his right side. This would begin a long and slow physical decline that, while inconvenient, did nothing to dull his intellectual gifts. On January 17, 1742, after requesting and drinking one final glass of wine, Halley, too, would leave this world and its cares behind. He would be buried next to his wife in the cemetery of St. Margaret's at Lee, near the Royal Observatory. His obituary paid little note of his work on comets or mathematics, instead, not all that surprisingly, focusing on his voyages of scientific exploration and his work to further maritime navigation.
It wouldn't be until 1758, as his predicted date of the return of the comet began to approach, that anticipation began to build. When the comet was sighted on Christmas Day, 1758, just as Halley had predicted, his confirmation of Newtonian physics made him not just a national hero, but an international celebrity some 16 years in the grave. Before 1579 was done, the comet of 1682 and now 1758 would be known simply as Halley's Comet. Halley's legacy, of course, is far more than the comedy is best known for. In his lifetime, he published more than 80 articles in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, and this does not count the work he did on the first edition of the Principia, nor the various reports made to the ministries, boards, and panels who had occasionally funded and oversaw the work he did. In this part of our two biographical episodes, I've not even mentioned his work on lifetime mortality tables that now forms the basis of actuarial accounting and life insurance today, his numerous papers on mathematics and numerical analysis, nor his efforts to attempt to date Stonehenge. Additionally, in his lifetime, he was one of the less than 20 or so men who were actually paid to do scientific work outside of an academic institution marking him as one of the first men for whom science was a primary vocation. Finally, I would argue that he, more than any person of his time, shaped the policy of a government already inclined towards science. From James II, to whom he sent a copy of Newton's Principia, through William and Mary, who funded the Paramore expeditions, to Anne, who relied on his advice and counsel through the War of Spanish, Spanish Secession, until the first two Hanoverian kings. It is hard to imagine the British government, from admiralty to industry, embracing this new way of thinking and exploring so fully, had Halley not been so involved and so successful in his endeavors on every front. While he did little to directly contribute to the coming Industrial Revolution, it is clear that the British ethos that so wholeheartedly embraced the advances and implementation of scientific principles owed a great deal to Halley's efforts and influence. As I bring this episode to a close, let me conclude with a few comments. If you haven't been able to tell, in my research for and writing of these episodes, I've developed just a bit of a science crush on Halley. Apart from Kepler, who will likely always remain my favorite scientist for a number of reasons, I think Halley has probably jumped to the number two spot in my estimation. He seems like he was a brilliant man who was genuinely likable. He got along with royalty, other natural philosophers, Flamsteed notwithstanding, and mariners with remarkable equanimity. He was brilliant, but he doesn't seem to have been arrogant. He's ambitious without being pushy. And more than anything, he's endlessly energetic and optimistic. If I were to do the whole in fight for people living their dead to dinner thing, I would have to say that Halley would, without question, make that list. Even better, one gets the sense that if invited, he would gladly accept. He is quite the fellow. Next, please allow me to acknowledge my sources. While one may actually purchase a copy of Halley's logs from the Paramore voyages, along with associated correspondence and commentary, my main source for that material was Julie Wakefield's book, Halley's Quest. It's a nicely readable account of the first two voyages interspersed with biographical and historical details about Halley and his times. Despite some listeners' complaints that my recommendations are beginning to endanger their marriages or the structural integrity of their homes, I would recommend this book for those who would like to read a bit more detail in the account of the events we've only sketched out here. My only regret is that it isn't available electronically. My other main source for this episode is an introductory biography of Halley written by David Ibsen. This does a nice job of giving a short, chronological overview of Halley's life and can be found as an ebook at various online retailers. For those who would like to learn a bit more about the Silly Island disaster and the work of John Harrison, let me recommend two sources. The first is Dava Sobel's well-known book titled Longitude. 
The illustrated edition has some wonderful pictures of Harrison's various chronometers, the earliest of which provide excellent examples of how form follows function. For those who are curious but don't want to buy the book, you can find pictures of some of Harrison's chronometers at our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. Also, as part of this month's Tripod Initiative, let me also recommend the episode of the Curious Minds podcast on the Scilly Islands disaster. As you may know, Ran Levy and Kelly O'Loughlin over at Curious Minds are longtime friends of our show here. Their podcast focuses on the technological application of various scientific ideas, likely due to Ron's training as an engineer. And I can tell you that I really enjoy each episode that they release. So if you haven't already checked out their show and you're looking for another podcast to enjoy, I would suggest you head over there and start with their episodes on the silly disaster and then explore around a bit to see what you like. Finally, if you haven't already done so, why not take a moment to subscribe to this show on whatever service you're using and if you enjoy the material, leave us a strong review. Also, you can find us on Facebook where we have a group to foster additional communication about the various things that strike our interest. Recently, we posted some graphics developed by crew member Jessica Grania, and we'd like some feedback from you on what you think of those. If you'd head over there and weigh in, we'd really appreciate it. Another thing a few listeners have done is post pictures of the various places they've been that are related to the material we're covering or have covered in our podcast. If anyone would like to post a photo of themselves at the Royal Observatory, for example, that would be smashing. Also, as I've mentioned in other episodes, the music for our show comes from the compositions of the Blue Dot Sessions. If you're interested in learning more about the work of this eclectic musical collective, you can head over to their website at sessions.blue. They do a lot of work for folks looking for atmospheric music for film and drama work, and I'm sure they'd be willing to talk to those who'd like to commission something. Next week, we'll leave the realm of biography to return to our historical narrative, to discuss the wide-scale adoption of Newtonian ideas and the triumph of mechanics. Until then, full sails on your journey.